Hey, uh, hey, hey, yeah, hey, what a time to be alive. I'm leather for dead, now I'm living right. No new friends, no new advice. That was high then, but we got bigger heights. We got big fish, bigger fish to fry. Better myself than I wrote a dice. Man, it ain't a gamble if you know you nice. Just Welcome back, Dollar and a Dream Podcast. I'm your host, Ara Amen. This is the number one podcast in Dallas. And today, my guest is Colin. How do I say your last name? Burwinkle. Burwinkle. Mm-hmm. How, how close are you to hold this thing? Hold that sucker up as close as possible. Right here? That's yeah, good. yeah. Cool. Well, I'm glad you're here, bro. Yeah, I'm glad I'm here, dude. This is a sweet studio. I'm excited <laughs> to you. just be real and, and get into the depth of things. Yeah. And I man, I should have wore a suit today, but it is what it is. You're looking phenomenal. Shout Thank out! You me. wanted to shout out somebody yes. today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to shout out my man Michael. Uh, Michael Burrows. At, at Michael Burrows. Okay, I didn't know his last name, but Michael Burrows, the man, um, over at Debonair Square. So he hooked me up today with one of these things. I'm gonna show you the whole product, but it's just um, a pocket square and he only uses the finest of silk so these are made in italy yeah and they're made um at the same uh manufacturer as some of the best designer brands in the world and you can tell the the difference between this and something that's just machine stitched or whatever he, he was showing me all the details and how they roll the edges um how and you can tell the difference in silk like this like brings volume when it comes out of the of the pocket it's like the detail behind everything and i got to know him and he's a great guy um just super detail oriented guy in general yeah and uh it was so cool to sit down and talk with him and this is really the the masterpiece of the of the product oh you got the you got the the whole set the the pocket dude yes this this is the masterpiece because if you got a suit and it's got a silk pocket on the inside yeah and you got a silk um, pocket square it like falls down and it, it loses its shape but the the felt on this which is actually made in Italy as well so he's using only the finest materials which is great I love quality but like when you put your uh, pocket square inside of this and set it up and then you put it in, into the pocket it's like never loses its shape yep. it's, it's just like the the best way to wear a pocket square and I'm all about the best way to do anything. So I'm reading this book right now. It's called The Way of the Samurai. Ooh. And they say, in the book, it says, if there is anything to be done, there is a best way to do it. So what they mean by that is literally every task, there is a best way to do everything that you're doing. Um, and they get into, uh, like, the samurai had, when they drank tea, it was a ceremony. And they got into... Um, how they were picking up the glass, how they were setting the table, how they were using the spoon. Everything was just perfect. And the Western world, so Americans thought it was like, ah, that's like so tedious, this and that, whatever. But what they didn't understand is when when it came down to it, that best way, that super uh, detailed approach to it was what they would say is the most graceful which means that, and this is the way they define this, is they're not wasting any movement. And Got you. so when, they are, when they're setting up the table, it's the most optimal way. It saves them the most time because the way that they drink the tea, maybe it keeps the, the glass cleaner so it's easier to clean at the end. You know, so like all these little details matter. And that's what I appreciate about Michael and what he's doing. He created a fantastic product and the detail is just there yeah yeah M- michael is one of the the most um i don't even know one of the most extraordinary men i've ever met in my life seriously um he actually taught me uh how to tweak some things in my life that made a huge impact early on um in regards to how to dress and how to just kind of carry myself as a man so i'm really looking forward to doing more collaborations with him oh seriously yeah i mean he and then on the inside of the box actually i have the box with me 
I love the presentation. Like, dude, it, it's an experience. Oh, you yeah. don't just it, get a you don't just get a product. You get an experience. Dude, and yeah, exactly. And sitting down with him, like I, he was like, "Yeah, you can order it online." I'm like, "No, dude, I want to sit down with you." Yeah. Like I I I don't know who you are, but you have this product and it's cool, and I want to know why you have this product. How did you How did you get in contact with him? It was, uh, it was, it was just Instagram. Instagram. Yeah, I just I hit him up on Instagram. So if you reach out to him, the Debonair Square, reach out to him on Instagram. Um, and I, I just said, Hey, I know some people that know you and I know, um, they have your product and I like what you're doing and I respect the grind of a small business. And I said, Hey, like I, I want to sit down with you and crazy enough, I, I take pride in like being on time and early today has been kind of a crazy day. I even showed up here late, That's but I, uh, I had a session with Violetta earlier today and just like took her through some movement stuff and we were just talking and the next thing I know an hour goes by and you know how it gets with her sometimes, you know, it's it, even anybody at PHP, you know, you just get lost in the sauce, yeah. right? You're just talking and you're one thing leads to the next and you're just like mindset, 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 only quality people. Right. But I look at the, the time I'm like crap, dude, it's, it's a, it's an hour past what I need to do. So I, I message him. I'm like, Hey bro, sorry. Like I need to meet you an hour later. I'm like, I'm like, Late as I could be, I pull up and he's looking fresh. I'm in an athletic suit and, and like not even a suit, like just an athletic outfit. And, and I'm, I'm just like, we're at a, this nice coffee shop downtown on Elm street. And like, I, I'm literally just wearing athletic clothes. He's looking fresh as can be. And, and then he shows me this and, and he opens it and he says, you, you see that on the inside? Yeah. Oh, and I'm just like, come on, man. Why, why, don't, why don't you read, read what it says? Okay. It says, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And that's so powerful. And he, he said he, he took it from one of his friends that gave him the blessing to use it. And I'm sure that there's, it's been used so many times in history, but that statement in itself, I mean, it doesn't matter. You don't know who you're going to meet. Right. And so like I, I used to pride myself in the opposite, not even the opposite, but I had a different mindset years ago where it was, it was, um, I didn't care what I looked like because I knew what was up here was valuable. Right. And now I have a different mindset of, okay, let me make the impression that I know what I'm talking about without even saying something to somebody. So I'm going to present myself in a better way. And then when I, when I talk to them, it's going to be almost like reassuring. Right. So uh, shout out to Michael, because I mean, he, just in the, the two hours, two and a half hours that we spent together in a coffee shop, um, we had some phenomenal conversation and I can't thank him enough for the, what he's doing for men's fashion. Yeah. Yeah. He has a lot of other uh, businesses that he's doing for men, too. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Phenomenal, outstanding guy. Mm -hmm. um, but I want you're, you're an outstanding guy, too, my man. Let's let's not let's not that. let's not get that <laughs> twisted. So I don't really know how to introduce you. What what do you do? Because you're you help million dollar athletes. You, you help athletes all around the world. You help people all around the world. Mm. What what do you do? How, how would how could I introduce you? Probably. Um. I would say in the simplest form, I'm, I'm at the forefront of changing the way that people view working out and training people that make millions of dollars is cool. But like, that's not, that's not what I take pride in. I take pride in, and the original mission statement is saving the world's connective tissue. Okay. And we are currently under the process of developing an AI assessment that can determine the likelihood of injury for a human. So I would say uh, to, to introduce me is, is um, the man that wants to save people's connective tissue, I guess. But like, really, it comes down to back to the way of the samurai, that book, like if there is anything to be done, there is a best way to do it. And that's where I mean, years ago, uh, my now business partner, Jacob and I, we were sitting at, uh, like just a coffee table in, a, in an apartment in the Woodlands, Texas, which is near Houston. And we had this word that is commonly used now in like functional training, 
that is um, the word's called connected and you want to stay connected to your trunk and spine when you move. And that was like a common word that was being thrown around in that industry at the time. And we learned that through people in, um, in Houston, it's, uh, the facility's called Texas baseball ranch. And we were learning how to throw in the most optimal way. And we were trying to be connected throw when baseballs. we were throwing. Yeah. Okay. And we were trying to be connected <clears throat> I'm, I'm to sorry. our, your background is baseball. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but uh, by far, like, that's that's really the only sport I've played. Um, dabbled in a lot of others, like, recreationally, but, like, just baseball for the most part. But being connected to the trunk and spine was a word being thrown around in that community. And I asked Jacob, I said, is there a way that we could be connected in every single movement possible? And then it was funny, like, I, I went and I, like, reached for the glass and I was, like, trying to, like, do it like I was throwing. And, like, I was, like you see what I mean? He's like, yeah, I see what you mean. So then it kind of sparked this idea where years later we ended up starting a company together, which is now known as gateway max, um, to where we're trying to save the world's connective tissue in the most optimal way to move the body. So this all started because you asked a question. Yeah. You, you okay. That's so interesting. Okay. Let's go back a little further back. I want to, I want to know your origin story. Where were you born? What was family like? Okay. Cool. So where was I born? Um, pretty sure it was um, it's either Bettendorf or Davenport, Iowa. I can't remember which one, but they're right next to each other. Uh, I think it was Davenport, Iowa is where I was born. I was born at 4.20 a.m. in the morning. Well, a.m. morning. But um, born at 4.20 a.m. on February 4th, 1998. Um, so I my birthday was actually this past weekend and uh, just turned 26. So, but anyways, the, the small town Iowa wasn't really that small, but it was small enough compared to where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. Especially when you just said, oh, Dallas is so small. But like <clears throat> where I'm from, much smaller, no skyscrapers at all. <laughs> um, and growing up playing baseball there, it was just like uh, some of the fields I'd play on, it was like gravel. Like the dirt was gravel. Like if you slid, you're you're getting cut up uh -huh. almost every time. And if you're taking a ground ball, like you don't know if that ground ball is gonna come up and hit you in the face or if you're gonna feel it in your glove and you just had to just take it. And um, there, was, there was a lot of times, you know, getting hit in the face by ground balls, getting in the chest. I mean, that's every baseball player. So that is what it is. But uh, growing up in, in small town Iowa, there's really nothing there but corn, you mm -hmm. know? It's just like, you travel five minutes outside the city and you're you look to the left it's corn you look to the right it's corn and that was pretty much it not a lot of noise um yeah i mean it was, it was pretty boring to say the least <laughs> got you what was family like uh family um family was good it uh, really not much bad to say about my family um nothing uh the only, the only thing that I would say is it was very a, how do I explain it? Um, nobody in my household ever told each other that they loved each other. And it wasn't necessarily from a place of like that we didn't love each other. We knew we loved each other because we, we took care of each other when it was, when it was time to do that. And um, big shout out to my brother because he, he did a lot of, he made a lot of mistakes in his life early on um and i was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to learn from that and it's it's great to learn from your own mistakes but early on to learn how to learn from others mistakes that i feel like right now that's what set me apart is i learned how to learn from other people's mistakes very early on in life and that set me up to become the person i am today because now i can watch everybody else around me and be like, okay, I don't need to do that. I don't need to do that. And now by the process of elimination, I kind of have this like laser focus to where I'm going. Got you. So that's really what family taught me early on was having an older brother gave me an opportunity to learn from others' mistakes. Cool. Okay. How did you get into 
baseball and then eventually get into the field you're in because mm -hmm. i i kind of know a little bit about the story but I, okay. I want you to explain that evolution of being an athlete helping other people and then realizing that you're about to change the world yeah this is this is, this is a good story um so first of all getting into baseball when i'm younger which um as a as a white male it's every dad's dream for their young <laughs> son to go play in the major leagues yeah that's just the way it goes it's like all right little johnny's gonna play in the major leagues let's yeah. go right um and and i appreciate that out of out of my dad and he, he uh and this is one thing i will mention um about my dad is um he built houses for a living and i'll, I'll get i'll kind of tie all this back together he he built houses for a living at the time and he he's a carpenter um by by trade and eventually opened up his own company which um we're very blessed because it, it's been in business for shoot i don't know over 15 years now i think and it does well and uh it's it's really only um been through word of mouth that that he's grown his company and he is successful based off his reputation and that's really cool to watch and I'm really proud of him for that. But um, him having that career background, it was measure twice, cut once. It was do it right or don't do it at all. And that was, was an awesome thing to have in my life early on as well. And to, to tie that into all of this, like getting into baseball, moving forward, understanding I have an opportunity to, to change the world, it... Um, let me grab a drink. I just got in the the ice bath before I came. The the plunge. Uh huh. And like sometimes like it has like a cleaning agent in it. Like it cleans itself. Uh -huh. It's got some chemicals in it, but it's like they're better than chlorine for your skin. Okay. But if you like, I go under every time, and uh -huh. if that gets in your throat, dude, <laughs> dude, it messes you up. <laughs> but um, anyways, so getting into baseball at a young age because you know my dad just puts me in there t-ball whatever my brother played baseball uh, my brother was a wrestler by the way where i come from uh produces probably the best wrestlers in the country like yeah it wasn't the, the movie uh no i'm not gonna remember go ahead but yeah anyways uh bet north iowa bet north high school is one of the um the best high schools to go to for wrestling in mm -hmm. the country and we produce a lot of guys that go to like Minnesota, Iowa State, Iowa, like Midwest wrestling is like unmatched. Right. Um, and my brother was really good, won some state championships um, uh, and played played baseball. And that was his passion. And I kind of followed in line with that. So it just makes sense with him being seven years older than me that I'm just looking up to him doing that. So since he was in ball, um, I got into baseball and I was very heavily into it. But uh as I started getting more and more into baseball, like 10, 13 years old, I actually like didn't even want to play. Um, and, and this is interesting for a lot of people to know about me that I was at, at that age, I was introduced, it was fifth grade. I was, dude, I remember it like yesterday, I was introduced to the game called World of Warcraft. <laughs> okay. Now, this game is like crack. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you. Um, so I get introduced, my brother's friend, he comes over, loads it up on our computers. Back when you had to download it through the disc too. Like it wasn't just like online, you click a download, like you had to go get the disc, download it, like make your profile, whatever. And he had like some of the best characters in the game and I'm getting on there and he, he lets us use his account. So I'm getting on there like playing with the best characters and like we're not, I wasn't supposed to log into this character because it was like his pride and joy kind of thing. And like I made my own character and then eventually got my own account. And then next thing I know, I have, I think it was, I think my main character in the game, I was at like 486 days played of mm -hmm. game time. And if you know anything about game time, it's not 486 days that I logged in. It's, 486 days of accumulated time spent on the game so like if i played for three hours that day that would add to the game time so like throughout my whole high school and early college career 
and middle school, I was playing that game uh, enough to put the, uh, um, almost 500 days played. So, like, think about that for a second. You, That's not you were, idle time. No. That's just in-game. That's like yeah, I'm no. playing. I, I, I got 10% you know? legit in Call of Duty to toot my own heart. Hey, man, I was so doing I, that, I have, too. I have, I have hours. Yeah, I have hours, too. I was doing that, too. Like, <laughs> I was switching back and forth. I was in my basement. We had this big TV. I had I had a Call of Duty plan, and then I would get bored of Call of Duty. I'd get on WoW, and yeah. I'd just swap back and forth. Dude, I, if I wasn't at school or at baseball, I was playing games. Yeah. And my parents had to, like, force me to come eat food, blah, 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 this, that. Some days I stay up three days straight, dude, just, like, yeah. grinding on the games. And to to kind of bring that back to, to the baseball thing was, like, I didn't want to play ball anymore because I was getting so entrenched into video games. And that also has something to do with my passion of the day because I was sitting for so long. And when you mix the most explosive sport in the world with sitting for long periods of time, what happens is you start to destroy your body wow. very quickly. And that's what I did. Three discs in my lower back were starting to get destroyed. And I had sciatica all the way down my left leg where I could barely even stand up. And that was, I was 18, 19 years old. As a sophomore in high school, I was the best pitcher on our team. I had like 1.64 ERA in the season. I threw, I think it was... I threw two no hitter. Well, I threw one no hitter, and actually, this is a funny story. I had a second no hitter going, and um, this guy from Assumption High School, the last inning of the game, he hits like what we would call like a, a little duck snort, like it's like a little nosebleed hit, like in between right field, second base, and first baseman, and it like goes over and like barely lands to the ground, and like he gets the first base. It was the last inning. And, uh, and like he's celebrating on first base, you know, you know whatever. Like, and I'm like, damn, man whatever <laughs> you know so um my sophomore year i was balling and then everything started settling in i was uh and this is this also kind of goes into why i do what i do i started doing crossfit for uh li literally every day like i was like working out until on, on the verge of like throwing up and it's like it's not like that's like crazy or anything um like right now i'm actually in uh david goggins book can't hurt me right yeah, so i'm listening book. to him right and i'm just like that's nothing right so like i didn't really go through pain but like i did you know but like the the thing is is the way that i that i was told to move in crossfit was not beneficial to the way that i was moving on the mound yeah so it was actually the exact opposite um and and we can get into that a little later but um now i'm sitting now I'm going to CrossFit, which is destroying my body as well. So sitting, CrossFit, destroying my body, school, sitting, yeah, right. And then I'm going into baseball, and I'm expected to make the most explosive movement in, in, that a human can make, which is throw the baseball as hard as you can. Um, besides that is swing the bat as hard as you can, right? And because those, those two movements are just that, and there's nothing else. It's boom, okay, get the ball, reset, boom, get the ball, reset. So it's like... You put everything into one second and then that's it. So I'm doing that starts to destroy my left hamstring, my lower back, everything. And <clears throat> by the time I'm 18, 19 years old, like I said, I've got all these issues. I don't know what to do. I'm at a junior college now because my ERA went from a 1.64. And then by the time I'm a senior, my ERA is like a 7.0. And if you know anything about baseball, 7.0 sucks. Like that's bad. <laughs> like you shouldn't be pitching. Um, and, and I'm not saying like it, you shouldn't be pitching, but I'm just saying you should probably figure something out. Right. <laughs> um, and so, I, I mean, I was going, when I was younger, I was going to, um, Missouri, Branson, Missouri, and this is crazy how it's all going to loop around in a minute. But, um, I was going to Branson, Missouri for camps and like, I was getting looks like, um, and like everything when I was, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old. And then by the time I'm 16, 17, when it really matters, when it's time to go somewhere and play ball, nobody wanted me. Mm. I had to walk on at a junior college and, um, and it, it was, it was a good junior college. It was, I mean, I'm thankful enough that I even got to play there. But the thing is, is I didn't even play because my body was in so much pain and we did like military type training where it was like okay we're gonna run around this track until somebody throws up like that was kind of what we were doing in junior college for baseball and anybody 
that plays juco baseball knows what i'm talking about like that that forms a brotherhood it's very similar to, to military type stuff um people some of the coaches are crazy and they do stuff that they're not supposed to but it's whatever it's we just keep our mouths shut and we just do it um and it's not just juco but you know there's a lot of uh, athletic programs that do stuff like that which is it's sometimes it's good for building culture but it's it is what it is um yeah i think those moments where coaches kind of push the team to the limit to see where they can break that show that really galvanizes the team together mm. yeah so when you go really through important. pain together and you yeah. suffer together it, it definitely builds a bond but there's there's other ways to do it too which is whatever we don't really need to get into that as much but like as i go through my first year of college baseball we're running and i'm, I'm telling the coach like because like i didn't really know what sciatica was at the time like i just knew that i had a pain in my leg mm -hmm. and thought it was normal i'm getting older things are going like south with my body you know whatever and then it gets to the point where we get back from a run and we're outside the dugout and i'm like coach like i can't even like move my leg and he's like i don't care <laughs> and i'm like well, I can't move it, right? Like, I, I don't know what to do. Like, he's like, okay, well, like, y you need to go to the doctor's office and you better not go home, right? You better bring me the slip that shows that you actually went there. Because, like, you know, he's not, he doesn't want anybody, he doesn't want any snowflakes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, so he's no weeding excuses. people out. He's weeding people out, yeah. And, like, I'm not somebody that's that's going to sit there and and uh, and just quit because, like, it's tough. Like, I was just like, dude, like I can't, I can't move my leg. And like, it was a nerve pain and I didn't understand at the time. Right. But I keep doing all these things, whatever. And then it eventually it starts to transfer to my arm because now this is weak and this is the landing leg for me. And everything starts getting exposed up the chain. My elbow starts hurting. And like my shoulders are all like scrunched up like this from playing video games all the time. And then all, all of a sudden, like this was actually my senior year of high school that this started, but um, I threw like a, it was like a 156 pitch game my senior year of high school. And my whole, literally when I got out of the game, my dad was like uh, assistant coaching. And I, I looked at the coaches and I'm like, I can't feel my arm. <laughs> and they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, yeah, I can't feel it. And it's just like sitting there like twitching. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but like, I can't feel my arm and like we went to the doctor and they were like okay yeah it's ulnar nerve subluxation which if you don't know what that is it's when you have this thing called the cubital tunnel you know your funny bone mm -hmm. okay the cubital tunnel where the ulnar nerve sits in the ulnar nerve is is the nerve that uh can, is uh, responsible for these three fingers mm -hmm. it runs all the way down through the bottom half of your arm runs through that's your funny bone mm -hmm. is the ulnar nerve so there's a sheath in there that holds the ulnar nerve in and my sheath evidently is broken in both of my arms it's like it's like just not there and they were telling me that when i would go to throw i was creating so much tension through that side of my arm that the ulnar nerve would pop out and then go back in and it would move around in there and when that happens all the tissue inside of there gets inflamed okay and so like you have a nerve here and then it starts to clamp down on the nerve and when you get compression on a nerve, that's when you start to lose feeling. Mm. And so I lost feeling in my arm. It felt numb and like fat and like swollen, but it looked fine. But then it would just twitch and it would twitch. So like every now and then if I threw too much, it would just twitch and I couldn't feel it. So basically at this point, uh, my uh, I'm in early college, my first year ball, my legs destroyed my arms starting to get destroyed. My velo goes down. I was throwing like 84, 85, like, like sophomore year into junior year of high school. And then it starts going down and down and down. And now I'm only topping like 78, 79. And I could still get guys out cause I had good pitches. I knew how to pitch. I didn't throw that hard, but I knew how to pitch. Mm -hmm. um, and so it got to the point where it was like, dude, like I can't even play ball anymore. So, I in quit. college yeah my first year of college and the season didn't even start yet and i quit and i'm not a quitter but like i was just like 
dude, like I just like can't throw anymore. Like I'm destroying my body every time I throw. And so I, I did quit. And like literally that day I got in my car and I bawled my eyes out. Like, like, cause like that's, that's what, that was my plan. It was plan A is baseball. Like I'm going to the league. That's it. And that that's the mindset that gets developed in a lot of young guys in America because it's like, it's kind of the dream, you know, but like I, I just saw that dream slipping away and I started working for my dad. I started uh, and he, at this time he had opened his the store and I, I didn't want to work for my dad because I didn't want like a cop out. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't want something to fall back on because I knew that if you have something to fall back on, you're going to take that route every time. Yeah. Your body's always going to take the easier route. Um, path of least resistance yeah exactly and like I, I knew it was there for me and i could have done that but i was like no like i can't do that so like every day that i was there well first of all he had me sweeping carpet fibers and i could only sweep for three minutes before i'd had to lay on the ground i had to get on my back put my feet up on a chair and i have to decompress my spine because i was in so much pain wow like literally like for like three minutes and i'd be like oh okay i can't do this anymore and i'd be on the ground it was like a nine out of 10 pain waking up every single day for like three years. And that like extends into my purpose where I, I just, I want to make sure that no other athlete or even human being for that matter has to go through what I went through because it was emotional. It was like, it got to the point of like, do I even want to wake up today? Yeah. Right. Like, and not to get that dark, but like it was that way. And so then I started researching and this is where like, you know, that, that time where you, where you kind of like make a decision, mm -hmm. right. And you're like, this is what I'm doing. And I saw Mike Trout hitting. And if you don't know who Mike Trout is, he's one of the best players to play the game today and possibly going to be one of the best players to ever play the game uh, of baseball. And I see him just hitting bombs and I'm over in, it, sitting in my dad's chair or my, at my dad's store in a chair and I'm like, I'm crippled and I'm 19 years old and he's like 25 at this point and he's hitting bombs. And I'm just like, what do I do to do that? Yeah. He's obviously doing something right. So then I like something clicked. I'm like, there's obviously something that these people are doing right. And I'm doing something wrong. If I hurt and they don't, which by the way, people want to do back surgery on me at this time. And I'm just like, no, not happening. And so, uh, cause I mean, when you have bulging discs, that's kind of like the path that they take. They're like, Oh, okay. Like this is happening. And like, you know, these discs are kind of getting out of, out of whack. Like we may need to go in and do like some, um, some rearranging, blah, 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 create some space. It's like, no, there's a different way. And if you, if you're watching this and you have back pain and anybody tells you that they want to open you up, don't do it. Hit me up. <laughs> right. Um, so Anyways, I'm sitting there and I, I'm watching Mike Trout and, and I'm like, I am in pain. So how do I figure this out? I start looking like, how do I throw hard? Like, that's the first thing I type in on Google. How do I throw hard? And I just keep looking, I keep looking. It. And I find the place called the Texas Baseball Ranch. Shout out to Ron. Ron's a great man. And he is who sparked my fire. This guy, Ron Wolforth, sparked my fire to become great. Like, you know how at the office, like, it's all like this mindset stuff. And like, you know, like you get main trainer, like Curtis and Spring the other day, right? Mm -hmm. Ron developed that in me to where I wanted to become the person that is like, you've got this kind of thing. And we, I, I was very, very fortunate to step on his turf at the right time to where like it, it's in Houston and I figured out a way to travel down there and learn from him. And he was looking at what are the best pitchers doing and what are the pitchers that are getting hurt doing mm -hmm. and how do we differentiate that? And how do we learn how to throw like the best pitchers like Nolan Ryan, Randy Johnson, Greg Maddox, you know, some of the greats. And what starts to happen is, I walk in there for a weekend and I think it was like $3,000 for a weekend. My dad goes with me and I'm sitting there and I'm like, this is great. He's talking mindset in the morning and 
he's like, yeah, if you want to stick around, like, like come talk to me, like if you want to stick around for the week. And then next thing I know, the weekend turns into the week, the week turns into two weeks, three weeks. And I just figured out a way to stay there, figured out a way to trade work for time. Right. Like I was working, like cleaning the ranch, like doing everything like, and I got thrown into this group that had just started. It's called legacy. And it and this is this is where everything changed this is where i became i went from arrogant know-it-all asshole to ego checked and understanding that i don't know anything and understanding that there's so much more to life than than suppressing your emotions and being just um just an arrogant asshole <laughs> literally <laughs> like i was just young and dumb and then i started to learn and he was he was my mentor and shout out to to this guy named uh richie boatman one of my best friends first mentor of all time and i can't thank him enough he brought me into this group he said hey he looked at where i was from he said davenport iowa i go to school in davenport iowa I've been praying for a throwing partner for years and you showed up on the list and you're sticking around this week. You're sticking around the next week. I want you to, to like come check out what we do in the mornings. I step in, it's a group of maybe like eight guys and Ron's up in the front and we're in, we're in one of the barns Ron's up in the front and he starts speaking mindset to us early in the morning, earlier before any of the other campers get there. And there's usually at one time about 50 campers there and this group, there was about eight people and he starts talking mindset and then we're all writing notes down and, and then he starts passing the mic around and he said, what'd you take from this? Why are you here? You know, these type of questions and it starts empowering me to, to, to realize that I have a voice, I can help others and there's a different way to live life. And that way was, was, um, like empathy and caring for others and putting everybody else before myself and in not in a way that's like letting people walk all over me, but in a way that's like, instead of climbing the rope and then cutting the bottom of it, cause I don't want you to catch me walking up the stair and holding out my hand. Mm. That's the, that was the difference. And next thing I know, we're two, three years deep into this program. And I'm a completely different person. I've been keeping a journal for two, three years. I've been telling myself that I'm gonna be the greatest of all time. You know, like that starts to weigh on you. And I actually had a conversation with Michael about this earlier today. I was like, dude, I've been keeping a journal for about seven years now. And like I was talking to him about it and he's like, oh, I got you beat a little bit. I've been keeping one for 35 <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Like, and I'm looking at him and I'm like, I would not be mad if I became that person. Yeah. You know, and like that's what kind of motivates me to keep doing what I'm doing because I know that all the successful people are doing that. Yeah. And so like I, I, I keep going through the legacy program, which by the way, the book it's called Legacy by James Kerr. It's a book about um the all blacks rugby team. You know what that is? All black rugby team? All blacks. That's what that's their title. Okay. All blacks. I do not know about New that. Zealand rugby. Um it's the most winningest sports organization in the world. Okay. At one point, their record was 361 and eight. Oh, wow. They knew what they were doing. Yeah. So this guy, James Kerr, goes over there and he studies them. And he's like, what's going on in this culture that isn't going on in, like, say, American baseball teams? Because what happens in American baseball? You get a team at the top. They win the World Series. And then maybe they win it the next year. But then somebody else comes knocks them off, right? And then somebody else comes knocks them off. And it's just like this repetitive cycle. Yeah, there are teams that have the most uh, World Series in history, but like that's gonna happen naturally. But there's no other sports organization that dominated like the All Blacks did. And so that's who we studied. And we found out that shit doesn't roll downhill. So when you go somewhere and there's a boss at the top and they say that to the next person like, you, you didn't do this. Like you should be, you should be going here and doing that. It, it turns into the guy at the top. The King is the first servant of the state. Hmm. You see what I'm saying there? The guy at the top, 
goes to the bottom. He finds, let's say, in the case of the book, this guy named Richie McCall was the captain. Mm -hmm. And he shows up early. And before the janitor gets there, he does the janitor's job. Wow. Right? So then what do you think happens after that? The janitor shows up and he's like, dude, thank you. Like, that means so much to me. And then he goes to the next person above him and he's like, hey, do you need any help today? What can I help you with? And the most powerful phrase that I have ever learned is how can I help? It's not, hey, do you need help? Because that insinuates that I don't really want to help, but I'm asking just to make you feel okay. Mm -hmm. How can I help you? It, 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 it assumes that like I actually do want to help because I do. And that statement's really, really powerful. But there's, hold up. There's a lot of different lessons in that book, but that one, and then there's another one that I've lived by for the past six, seven years. And <clears throat> Matthews Paula said it on stage. I think it was on stage at the big event, but he said uh, Kaizen. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm Continuous familiar. improvement yeah. in, the, in Japanese. It's a ba- Japanese business model, and the, all blacks have used that. Cause it's, it's no longer, okay, is this good or this bad? It's, it's, is this inform this is information and we can utilize it to move forward. Mm -hmm. So like getting emotionally attached to your outcomes doesn't result in continuous improvement. Yeah. So like, let's say I swung the bat and, and hit the ball into the ground and I'm like, dang, like I hit the ball into the ground. Right. And then I do it again. And then I'm like, I guess I'm not really on my game today. Right. Hit it in the ground. Oh, dang. Like, maybe I'm not really that great of a hitter. Hit it in the ground again. Should I really even be playing baseball? You see how that, like... Your thoughts spiral. Right? The emotion is there. But on the opposite end, it's like you hit one up the middle, and it's like, dang, I'm the best. And then you yeah. hit it on the ground, you're like, damn. Right? Have you ever read the book, Where's My Cheese? No. So but I'll put it I'll put it on the list. It's like <laughs> 90 pages. 90 pages? Perfect. It's, it's really quick. <laughs> and it's about these four ma- ma- uh, mice in mm. a maze. And two of the mice are just mice, and they're just running looking for the cheese, running looking for the cheese. And then there's right. two mice that have the brains of humans. And then the cheese disappears, and they'll be like, oh, no, the cheese is gone, and they just start thinking. So the, the mice that don't have the human brains, they just keep looking and finding. Mm. The, the humans, the mice with the human brains, they, like, sit down and contemplate, and then they just realize that the people that were think the humans that were thinking, they're not eventually getting the cheese. Mm. So it just shows, just keep going, just keep going. Yeah, and and I'll, I'll keep going with, with my story, but that, that brings me to to something very powerful that I did want to talk about today, but we'll, we'll come back to it. Cool. Um, but basically, that, that whole era of my life of spending time in Houston, Texas, developed me to become who I am today. And I cannot thank the people there enough and uh, like like I said, Ron Wolforth, that, that that man, he changed my life for for the the better. And like I I owe everything to him. And um, but yeah, that that group became very powerful. It grew from eight people to fifteen to twenty after two or three years. And it was like I could still hit up one of those guys today and be like, Yo, like what's up? Like how you doing? Like like even though it was just like camp for like six months out of the year, or three or four months out of the year. It was like we we really got to know each other because we're passing a mic around and talking about our feelings. Mm-hmm. And as men, what do we talk? Suppress your feelings, right? Mm-hmm. And like it was a way for me to change who I was in an environment, only quality people, right? Everybody there was, they, it, we were lions moving in the same direction. And like you look at you look at a highway and every car is moving in the same direction and they're all moving 70 miles an hour, what happens when one car on the highway just slams on their brake? Yeah. Everything's Accidents. ruined. Yeah. Everything's, everything gets ruined. That one toxic person yeah. can ruin everything in that, in that group. And you get accidents, you get traffic's backed up, it can't flow right. And Injuries, and death. Injury, yeah, everything, dude. So it's like when you find a group of people where everybody is focused on the same goal and you all want what's better for for everybody else, and you're all moving in the same direction, special things start to happen. And that's what we had. And um, and I'm appreciative of that because I I started to recognize 
how important that culture was. And that's when I walked into PHP and I saw what was going on. And I was like, whoa. At first I was like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Is this real? And then I took a step back and I came back and, and I was like, yeah, it's real. Yeah. It's real. Like these people really care. It, it's a interesting, I, I felt the same way too. I was skeptical. I think everybody I, is. Yeah. I, I just had a lot of faith in Patrick Bet David because I've been watching a lot. But yeah. I, what I want to get into is, so I came over to your gym uh, a couple days ago. You came over to my garage. Your, your garage, <laughs> your garage, which is a pretty nice garage. Thanks, thanks. But you told me to uh, get on my, what was it, S- sit down on my knees and then get up, and then get back on mm. my knees and get up. I did that a f- few times. Mm. And you're just telling me, what do you notice? Yeah. And uh, I don't even know what I noticed, right? I noticed... You know, being wobbly, the way right. I move my legs, the yeah. movement in my legs, how I put pressure on my the the front of my feet, not as much in the heels. Um, what what were you trying to show me? So I wasn't even trying to show you anything about your movement. The first thing I do with somebody is I get them to understand how much they're actually lacking focus. Okay. And that's that's where I want to go into what I was saying, like, we'll hold off. But like this new chapter of my life, which started January 26th of this year, a lot of people think like the new year is like new year, new me. But like, it's not. It's when you it's when you decide. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're not ready. Right. Especially as a creative mind. I understand the. The I guess I guess I would say the importance of procrastination. A lot of people look at procrastination as as a negative thing. Sometimes it's necessary when you are are, you're a creative mind, because like, and I'm not giving anybody a coping mechanism or a cop out, but it's like because you definitely need to be on your stuff. But sometimes, when you get knocked off your horse, it does you no good to force creation, Mm. and. I had to take some time and, and I, I wasn't focused. Uh, dude, I would say for the past two years, I haven't been focused. Yeah. And the only common thing between not being focused and being focused for the first four or five years and, and then the, the, these last two years was I didn't have a mentor. Mm-hmm. And when you don't have a mentor, you have nobody to one, look up to, but two, to call you out. And <clears throat> the importance of call out culture, you know, is extremely important. And so the back to what I was teaching you is learning to focus and understanding the importance of your focus because it's powerful. If I put my focus into my phone right now, we wouldn't be having a good podcast. Right. Right. It's just the way it is. And when people are moving around, sitting, talking, doing whatever, often they're losing their focus in and out, in and out, in and out. Cause yeah. like we're, we're so in tune with Instagram, um, uh, instant gratification, right? Like we all understand those basic things, but like to master your focus and, and we talked about this, but like when you master your focus or look at everything as an opportunity to master focus, what happens is by accident, we, we gain skills and all I was doing with you is one, making you aware of your body, but two, I was helping you understand that you weren't even focused. Yeah. And then when, when you started to understand that you needed to focus, then it was like, okay, it's go time. Let's talk about some drills that you can do to help yourself. And now let's kind of get into the details of things, which is really important to note because if, if I hadn't done that to you and I was just like, okay, we're going to get on the ground and do this and that, you might have like paid attention to some detail, but like you you wouldn't have had awareness of what was going on. And, and that's what that's what's amazing. What we could, the drills we kind of went through is you didn't tell me anything. Mm. You, you you just we just went through the motions and you're like, what do you notice? Mm. What are you noticing? And I'm like, OK, I'm noticing this. I'm noticing this. You're like, OK, what else are you noticing? And now I'm digging to find what. I was like, I've never really noticed that I've the way, the way I move my legs around. Yeah. It was like, I, I don't know why I get up and I move my legs in this like rotating motion. And then I looked at you dude, and you're like, oh, you're not doing it in that rotating motion. Right. I'm like, why? Like, why is this? Well, then you go back to the monkey see monkey do behavior 
that yeah. we're, that that is natural um, when we develop as as young children. You should have seen Violetta today. It was funny. So I did a different <laughs> one with her, where I just had her like jump and land, and then jump and land. And like I, when she showed up, she's looking around. It's like okay, we're here, and <laughs> I I tell her, you know, all I want you to do is I just want you to jump and land. I want you to notice what happens. Yeah, and she's looking at me like. <laughs> like, <laughs> like this is what I came here for. Like, and I'm like, yeah, like just do it. And she's like, I, I don't know. That's what she. That's usually everybody's first answer. They do the task and they say, I don't know, because most people are not taught how to become aware of their body, and that awareness in itself is curative. So, and that's actually a quote from Ron Woolforth. So that I've been using that for seven years. Say it again, right? sorry. Awareness in itself is curative. And I don't know if it came from Ron, but that's where I learned it. And like, if if you're sitting on your phone for six hours a day, but you aren't aware that you're doing it, are you ever going to fix it? No. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But then once you become aware that you're on your phone for six hours a day, you're like, whoa, this, this isn't going to work. Yeah. This does not add up to greatness. And then that's when you can make a decision. Exactly. And when you make that decision, that's when things change. Wow. You know, it's like change happens in an instant. It's just whether or not you're ready to, to flip the switch. Right. It, right. It, doesn't, it doesn't take a, it's all to do to make a change is make a decision, but you can't make a decision if you're not aware of what's going on. Exactly. That's it. It all boils down to awareness and awareness boils down to focus. Hmm. Right. And that's why this next chapter of my life for, I don't know, however long until I decide to become different is mastery of focus. And if I can master my focus, I feel like I'd be unstoppable. That's why I've committed to, to 60 books in 90 days. Be, and that's why I'm not giving myself an out. Like, you know, I'm, I'm studying for my test, I'm building a company, studying for my test, reading 60 books in 90 days, working out, hitting the cold plunge every day. Like all of these things, they have to happen. And it's like, I'm studying for my test or I'm trying to study for my test. Like, finding time for it and i'm like man am i gonna have to like put these 60 books on hold and then i'm just like no like why am i trying to give myself this copy like i can do it all but like i have to find the time i have to get rid of things other things that aren't good for me have to subside and that's that's what it boils down to is mastering your focus so that you don't lose sight of what your greatness is supposed to be Okay, I want what I want to talk about is you totally blew my mind. Like you <laughs> blew my like my fucking mind like the other day. I'm like, glad we can we can curse. Oh no, we can totally <laughs> curse. Like bro, the what you kind of talked to me about was when a baby crawls and when humans start walking mm -hmm. and we are getting set up for failure because parents are wanting kids to walk sooner than they're supposed to. Mhm. Mm Go through that. Okay. Unpack that because okay, so, yeah, I got you. So, all right. So, got set up in my chair for this. One. Yeah, this, this is this is, this is, is no. Is this is passionate. crazy, bro. This is where I get passionate, dude. Because this is how we change the world. Seriously, this is where it starts. The the it's it's a very true statement when people say like the youth have the power or the power is in the youth. Right. Facts. It's a very true statement because they're the next. They're next up. Yep. And we got to We as as a 20 something 30 something generation as leaders as leaders like well we can be a 20 30 something generation and be followers but like that's not going that's going to create a different outcome right, right. but a, as we become leaders and as we we create more leaders then we're going to change the world but where that starts is it it starts before they get this in their hands because we know like the evidence shows that when this entered our lives things went went different and, and David Goggins actually explained it this way, which I thought was brilliant. He said, the accessibility hindered our capability, mm. right? So like now it's like, okay, I have access to everything I ever want on here. Right. And now I, I'm no longer capable of using this because I'm relying on the accessibility of this. And now let me bring it back to, to the kids. So when when we develop we are meant to crawl and if we don't crawl for a long enough time then certain behaviors start to set in and 
whether or not it's good or bad doesn't matter. It's just an observation of what's going on. And the outcome of these decisions that we make for our kids affect them in the future. So let's say that we have a kid that is on the ground crawling their his his parents his or her parents um are very naturalistic they eat fruit you know they eat red meat they do all the things they are in the sun <clears throat> they're not using sunscreen whatever right they got all all the qualities of like a a healthy like natural person right they're dedicated to that lifestyle they're letting their kid crawl they're letting their kid develop on their own they don't have they don't have um they don't have all these uh like toys and things maybe they're just maybe they have like a um they have like paints and then they have like crayons and they have like a a, a chalkboard you know things for the kid to get creative and then they let the kid play outside and it's developing it's crawling and it doesn't stand up until it's almost two years old maybe it's trying to stand up at like one and a half years old but it's still figuring it out now we, we think we have that image of that kid right now on the contrary we have two parents that have full-time jobs corporate jobs that utilize their phone for almost everything they do for work they've got plenty of money right let's say they're half million dollar earners they got plenty of money they buy the kid an ipad at one and a half years old because the kid's crying 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 right and they, they buy the kid an iPad and they, they want the kid to walk. They want the kid to develop. So they're like listening to the trusted pros, right? They're like, yeah. oh, oh, put your kid in this and do this. This this equipment's so good for your kid. And they, they put their kid in this jumper, right? And you see it everywhere. These things are every, you go to Target, you don't go down the baby aisle, you're going to see one. You're going to see probably 10 of them, right? And it's just this stationary object for the kid to jump up and down. And what happens is, they start to feel for the ground. When, when we feel for the ground, we utilize the big toe. So imagine reaching and feeling for some water, right? In a puddle or a pool or whatever to see the temperature. You wouldn't touch your pinky toe in that. You would reach and touch with your big toe. That's just natural. It's just like the hand, the artistic side, the artistic side and the, the feel is in these fingers. Right. If I'm going to touch something, I'm going to go here. I would never do this to touch something. But when I go to punch something, I'm utilizing these outside three knuckles. And especially you can see how that knuckle sticks out more. Right. So I'm utilizing like this, this point here where like that is my shape of power. Right. That's my shape of feel and direction. Right. I'm pointing. I'm literally pointing that go that way. Right. So the big toes used for balance, direction and feel when we put the kids in this jumper they feel for the ground so they start reaching with the big toe they start creating what we then call a w sit in there when they sit down to the ground which is where the feet start pointing out they start utilizing the inside of the feet right it's all starting to like trickle in now imagine the kid and let's say that the the other family right the natural family let's say they're on a farm right and the, and the kids now developing into like six seven eight years old and now they have to do things outside they have to go walk outside, run outside. You have to carry bales of hay. They have to go get the eggs from the chickens. They have to chase the chickens around, right? They're developing skills and they're also developing focus because now they're getting tasks put in, in, in front of them that require them to focus. And the kid that has the iPad at two, three, four years old, now they cry every time they don't get the iPad. The screen's switching every two seconds. Their focus is just wavering away. And uh, I really like this quote. I can't remember who it's from, but it's uh, a child is like an empty slate and we can write whatever we want on them. Mm. And with that comes responsibility. And when we're talking about the kid that has the iPad and they're, they're in the jumper and then they, they stand up at one, one and a half years old, their feet are now pointed out and they're favoring the inside of the foot. And, and I've seen it so many times, but what happens is, is now when they're 15, 16, 17 years old, when they go to play an impact sport, they have a high risk of tearing their ACL. They have a high risk of tearing their Achilles. And a lot of them just have injuries so far early on. Like, dude, I've seen, 
I've seen high level gymnastics girls that have no fear that are just wearing boots at like 10 years old, right? They're, they're just in their facility. They can't work out. They can't do anything because they're, they're being taught in a way from a young age to, to have in unstable surface at the, at the bottom of, of their foundation, which is the foot. And it's affecting everything upwards. Like I've seen girls at th 13 years old tear their knee. Like why is that even happening? Mm -hmm. These kids should be playing outside, developing strength in, in a natural way that allows them to um, d develop this natural level of focus to, to go on and complete whatever task is in front of them. When you have no pain, you can enter the flow state. Mm. When you have pain and you're thinking about it all the time, you I always, focus. yeah, exactly. I say this all the time to the, to the hitters that I, that I train. Let's say Araldis Chapman's on the mound, 104, 105, 106 coming down the pipe. And you, you're thinking about your back ankle because you tweaked it yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> you lose, dude. Right. Like that's just the facts. Like if, if your thought is there and you've got that much time to swing the bat, like you, you can't win like that. You can't win for a long period of time like that. That's not a Hall of Fame career. Look at the guys like Dion. Mm -hmm. Look at the guys like Bo Jackson. Look at the guys like uh, Ichiro that played without fear. The, even Ricky Henderson, dude. Like some of the goats that played without fear. What do you think their childhood looked like? Wow. You know? No, no that, one that, rhymed. Yeah, wow. No one Ryan was a farm boy. Yeah. He had a paper out with his dad and he threw papers from the back of the truck, dude. Like he was just you think that developed him yeah, yeah. it did <laughs> wow okay so n next thing i want to that's freaking insane i mean we could talk about that for hours mm -hmm. and i'm sure one day we'll sit down and do that yeah we can um, do another one of these dude. oh we're, we're gonna 100 percent um i think it'd be cool to bring in an athlete too and and have like a yeah. conversation well, yeah well, we there's, could do that. There, i have so many ideas bro what i do want to squeeze in with the little time we have left is you're now uh would you call yourself a coach? Because you coach people, right? Yeah, hundred percent. So, so yeah, you coach, coach uh, multi-million-dollar athletes. Yes. And and there's a lot of egos at play when you deal with a multi-million-dollar athlete. How how do you come in and say and tell them, hey, I need to you you're doing this wrong, or or you don't even take that approach, but you, right. you're coaching them into changing the way they do everything with their body. So, so what type of mindset, what type of, uh, how do you make them aware? Mm. So that's a great question. Um, the first thing is usually those guys end up reaching out to me first. It's hard for me to walk in and say like, Hey, you're, you're not doing this right. Right. Like uh -huh. I've, I've been there, I've been in some high level weight rooms and I'm just like dancing around that subject. Right. It's less the athletes and more like the strength coaches or athletic coaches that are involved in the organizations. Right. Because they think that they know better, which is fine. Like, you know, like I'm not dogging on anybody's principles. Like if, if what you do works for you, do it like, but over here, we know if it doesn't make sense, we don't do it. And we've studied the greatest athletes that ever lived. We've studied the indigenous tribes that have, uh, rarely any non uh, non-contact catastrophic injuries like if you look at the the statistics on like when they get hurt and when we get hurt mm -hmm. it's like inverse yeah and what's crazy is every year for like the past like 10 or 15 years um knee surgeries hip surgeries uh i think just skyrocketing just, yeah it's every sport e you hear so about every it. year it goes up by 300 percent compounding every year if you look at the past like 10 15 years and, and even like um if, if you like play fantasy sports it's it's not when someone gets hurt or it's not if someone gets hurt it's when someone gets hurt yeah i mean it, it, um, i mean unless they know how to move unless they've kept their innate movement from when they were a child like most of these guys are are just like and they blame it on so many things oh it's the turf it's the field it's the holes you know okay well go look at ed reed you know ed reed played for what 13 years and he played on astro turf too he didn't get hurt yeah. the only time he got hurt this is funny the only time he got hurt is so Tom Brady was playing against Ed Reed, playing against, playing against the Ravens, and he like slide kicked him in the groin because he knew that he couldn't win when if Ed Reed was on the other side of the field, because like Ed Reed's the goat, right? Like arguably the best safety to ever play the game. And if you watch how he moves and you go look at a, a 
six-year-old kid that has crawled for a long period of time, they run the exact same way. And But anyways, to get back to your question, um, it's it's crazy to to think about the egos that come into play because these guys are at the best of their game. <clears throat> and I recently have d- dealt with this where I've been told, like, you're the greatest in this industry. You're the GOAT and, like, things like that. And that starts to get to your head. Yeah. And like Curtis was saying, um, Caesar had he had hired that one person. Yeah. Right. And that the, the guy's only job was to say, hey, you're human. Yeah. You're only a human. You know, like that, that hit me. And I'm like, oh, shit. Like, I can do more. Right. You know, because like Caesar could have gotten comfortable and just been like, yeah, you know, it is what it is. Right. And then everything crumbles down. But like, nah, he was he was good. He was the goat. Right. <laughs> In some you way, get shape comfortable. Or form. You, you, right. You think you're OK. Yeah. You think you're OK. And, and that's when people take advantage of you. That's when I lost my focus. Wow. There you go. Right. There you go. When people were telling me that I was because like when Curtis said that, like, hey, people are going to say like, oh, like Max Life, like, you guys are doing so good. Like block it out yeah just go here like you're only human you need to focus like it's all about focus but my question that i ask these people is what if there's a better way that's it do you think that what you're doing is the absolute best way well if you think that that's fine but what if there was a better way because nobody let, let me let me say it this way when when you're on the verge of like innovation you're you're not asking the question of like of like what's the safe what's the safe route you know it's what's what's the absolute best route and what if we could do it this way like that that statement of what if is innovation right what if and when you look at it that way like when I first lo- learned the, the the movement stuff and all, like I was kind of being like we were, we had a set of rules and and we were it was kind of like a box that it was put in, and and that was innovative, and then I said, what if there's a better way than that? Mm-hmm. And that's the question that I keep asking myself is like, what if the way I'm doing it isn't the best way? And that's that's where like even with the culture at PHP, it's fantastic, right? What if there's a better way? Yeah. And that's where I love that. That's where that's where Max Life comes in. That's where uh, Empowered Empire comes in. That's where y- your organization comes in. Money it's marathon. Like money marathon, right? Like that's where that that comes in. Where Matt and Sheena Sapala did a fantastic job. But what if there's a better way? And, and they even preach that. They say the best way to show respect to your upline is to do better than. Mm. That. Yeah, I always say the apprentice is always better than the master. Always. Like it has if, to be. If, if then you're not a good master. Exactly. Then you're not and, a good master. And if if you're not okay with that and you are the upline, you have an ego problem. Yeah. That's tough. All right, man. Um the last thing in, in closing is what what is your why did God put you on this earth? What what are you here to do? What are you doing with your business, you're on the forefront of innovation in regards to uh, the mind, body, soul connection. What? Wh- why are you here? What? What is? What is Colin's impact going to be? My purpose is, again, just going back to who I was when I was 17, 18, 19 years old, is to make sure that no other human being has to go through what I went through, and I was put through that as a test to show, you know, this is what you're supposed to do. Right. And to, to, for me to get through that and go from nine out of 10 pain every day to a zero out of 10 pain every day and being able to do whatever I want with my body, that is, that's what I'm supposed to do. I was given this knowledge to give to other people. And that's what I'm going to do is go to the root is go to the the pediatric offices go to the youth organizations go like any youth baseball youth football like wherever it takes me it doesn't matter um we're we're definitely going to start with baseball because that's our our niche but go to the the route where they're they're where they're the youngest and show these kids that there is a better way than what we've been doing for the past 50 70 years 
because we need to do better as a human race and not only that but but preach preach the movement but preach mindset and that that's my purpose is to to give somebody the knowledge that i have right now and instill that into them when they're 15 so that they can be better than me and so that the world can just be a completely better place and i really believe that part of my purpose is getting us away from this Whoa. and it doesn't mean we have to get rid of it but to understand that it's a tool to access knowledge when we need it not something that we depend on on a daily basis appreciate your time my man thank you bro appreciate you cool that was nice